never knew he was out there, crouched low in the dark silence beneath tall pines, breath fogging the summer night's air. The home looked snug and private, far enough from other neighbors that screams would drift away unheard. He watched them for days, a charming drifter with eyes that never matched his smile, a mind twisted toward unspeakable things. His name was Joseph Edward Duncan, but to himself he was beyond names, beyond redemption, a pure predator, stalking easy prey. He picked the Groen family at random. The children's toys scattered across the yard had drawn him in, their primary colors a magnet for his darkest urges. For days, he learned their schedule, memorized the flicker of lights going off at bedtime, the sliver of a broken lock on the back door. The wind rattled the screen door as he slipped inside that night, hammer raised. Inside, he tied up the parents and their teenage son, each of them wide-eyed with horror. Ten-year-old Dylan and eight-year-old Shasta awoke to chaos and muffled screams. Before they could understand what was happening, this man, this thing, swept them into his car. As he pulled away from the home, he left behind broken bodies, destroyed dreams, and blood slowly drying on old wooden floors. For weeks, the children became nothing but playthings to him as he dragged them from one lonely campsite to another remote cabin. He offered them no mercy, only pain and humiliation. He starved them, beat them, and committed acts so vile and inhuman that the very darkness of the night seemed to recoil. He murdered Dylan at point-blank range after torturing the boy's spirit. Only Shasta's quiet pleas for life, her small voice unraveling something long dead within him, kept her alive. He told her that she had taught him how to love, yet his love was a rot at the core of his being, a mockery of any true human emotion. At a gas station, security footage would later show them under harsh fluorescent lights. The grainy video captured an ordinary enough scene, an irritated looking man, his young companion at his side. To a stranger's eyes, it might have seemed no more alarming than a father traveling with his sulky daughter. No one could know that this casual tableau, caught on camera, masked a truth of unimaginable horror. Eventually, hunger and desperate normalcy led him to a diner. Shasta sat opposite him, hollow-eyed and trembling inside, though outwardly calm. A waitress noticed the strange tension. Something was wrong. When the police stormed in, reality rushed back in brutal clarity. Shasta was saved after seven weeks of hell. As they hauled him away, he called out to her, asked if she'd visit him in prison. She, small and broken, murmured that she would. No one knows if that promise was ever kept. Convicted, sentenced to death, and later found responsible for three more child murders, Joseph Edward Duncan rotted in prison. Cancer claimed him before the needle could, and still, the darkness he unleashed never truly lifted. Shasta grew older, but could never outrun those nights. Drugs, jail cells, the heartbreak of losing her own children. Her life became a long corridor of shadows, each turn echoing the old nightmare. The world moved on, but her wounds did not heal. The scars stayed open, the horror never ended. In the end, it was never just about the monster at the door, but the endless, fracturing aftermath. The worst horror was not the final hammer's blow or the vanishing taillights, but the broken life that followed long after the monster died. They set sail with pride and certainty, two stout ships of war reborn as Arctic explorers, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror. The crews, over 150 bright-eyed British sailors and officers, left the familiar gray skies of England behind in 1845, their holds crammed with sealed tins and the sturdy conviction that they would carve a path through ice-latticed seas the Northwest Passage, that long-sought secret corridor through the frozen north, beckoned them like a ghostly promise. In those first weeks, the men were still certain they carried English order into an alien realm. But as the ships pressed deeper into uncharted waters, the Arctic seemed to close her jaws around them. Shallow passages littered with hidden rocks scraped at the hulls. Razor-thin ice flows crowded tight, trapping the vessels in a white prison. Winter arrived then lingered and lingered, days blurred into nights without sun. The dark sky pressed them down until it felt like the world had ended and only these two black ships and their frightened souls remained. The ice never melted as they'd hoped. Instead, it thickened year after year, 
welding Erebus and Terror into a barren plain of silent white, like insects trapped in resin. Time became a slow poison. Their provisions, once hailed as modern miracles, canned meats and vegetables, sealed tight against decay, proved tainted. In the dim lamplight of the ship's mess, the men pried open tins that hissed with foul odors. Rotten meat and corrupted brine flowed onto their plates. Those who could stomach a few bites soon suffered fevers, stomach cramps, and delirium. Even the water they drank, funneled through lead pipes, turned traitor. The creeping metal invaded their blood, rotted their minds, and eroded their reason. All around them, coughs rattled and wheezed, the ghost of old tuberculosis reasserting its claim. When their leader, Sir John Franklin, died, none could say precisely how, something in the crew's collective mind snapped. They huddled in whispering clumps between the creaking timbers of their ships, eyes sunken and skin raw with scurvy's lash. The men's lips cracked as if they had swallowed glass. They began to see things in the darkness, phantoms drifting between the towering ice ridges, shadows that whispered of home or glimmered with the faces of loved ones. Memory and time bled together in the eerie twilight, leaving them only hunger and fear. Finally, in the third year of this frozen purgatory, a desperate decision. They would leave the ships behind. They hauled rowboats onto sledges, loaded them with meager supplies, and began a slow, hopeless march southward. They stumbled across bleak, white deserts and dark, fractured shorelines, always under the stare of a silent, unblinking horizon. Boots split open, fingers blackened with frostbite. They limped and crawled, and at each makeshift camp, fewer stood up to march the next day. No one survived that doomed pilgrimage. When local Inuit hunters and Nitsilic travelers later came upon their final resting places, they found only desolation, shredded tents, and scattered bones in the eternal dusk, scraps of uniform hanging off skeletal forms, cook pots in the remains of fire pits, grisly evidence that in their last hours, these men, once proud sons of Britain's navy, had turned on each other in a final act of unthinkable horror, a half-burned femur here a gnawed rib bone there. The silence was absolute. The Erebus and Terror never returned to friendly shores. Their stories drifted back in fragments and rumors. Poisoned men, endless winters, madness drawn out day after day on a canvas of ice. And even now, beneath the Arctic's frozen veil, their ghosts remain, whispering, lost, and hungry in the darkness. They say the house looked normal enough from the street, just another weathered home in Tremont, Cleveland, where neighbors waved at each other. Children rode bikes through alleyways, and no one dared suspect what lay behind certain closed doors. But inside that battered place lived a man named Ariel Castro, and behind his locked basement door, Gina De Jesus, Amanda Berry, and Michelle Knight spent 12 years chained to his cruelty. It began with small absences, a teenage girl vanishing on her way home from school, another gone in broad daylight, their faces turned up on posters, local news channels, and prayer vigils. The city whispered about kidnappers and monsters, but the truth burrowed quiet and hidden, nesting in the old walls of Castro's home. The three young women endured horrors there, deprivation, humiliation, brutal beatings. When one of them carried his child, he allowed the birth, another. He kicked and pummeled until the fragile spark of life went dark inside her. Day after day, year after silent year, they lived in a hell no one else could see. Time passed beyond their reach. Seasons shuffled through the window cracks. The smell of cooking from neighboring houses, the hum of cars, and distant laughter were cruel reminders that the world still turned outside. Inside, it was nothing but heavy locks, dim lights, and a predator's twisted rules. Then, on a May afternoon, Amanda Berry saw her chance. Castro had neglected to secure something, a door, a window. She screamed for help, voice cracking with desperate hope. A neighbor named Charles Ramsey heard that call and did what few would have dared. He forced his way to her. Minutes later, the police surged in and found them. Amanda, Michelle, and Gina, still alive, but ravaged by unimaginable torment. Their captor was taken away in handcuffs, but if you think that was the limit of the cruelty visited upon these families, you'd be wrong. Long before that triumphant rescue, Gina de Jesus' mother had turned to the paranormal for answers. Grief can warp a mother's heart, drive her to seek truths in strange places. On a daytime talk show, a famous psychic, Sylvia Brown, looked her in the eyes and told her that Gina had died far away in Japan, 
sold like a piece of meat into sex slavery by foreign traffickers. This false prophecy sank deep into the mother's soul, leaving her numb and defeated, as if her lost daughter were truly rotting in some distant grave. That lie twisted the knife in a wound that might never properly heal. When the truth finally broke free, when all three young women stepped out alive, the psychic's words took on a nightmarish quality, a cruel riddle without answer, a painful reminder that in this world, monsters hide in neighbors' houses, and even those who claim visions can snatch hope away from the broken. For twelve long years, the horror played out just beyond ordinary sidewalks, and long after freedom came, the scars remain carved into memory, proof that sometimes the darkest terrors live closest to home, and that those who claim to see beyond the veil can just as easily blind you with a lie.